we've we've run over a little bit on the on the introductions. As you can see, this uh, one of the kind of the, the key things of DIY bio is that a lot of people are incredibly passionate about what they're doing. Um, so it's, if it, of course we run over on the on the introductions. Um, so originally the plan was that we were going to kind of you know, sort of like go over some of the sort of the bur burning issues, the sort of burning topics of, uh, of, of DIY bio. Some of the things that you know, so while we've had all these kind of, sort of incredible people gathering in one place. Um, that, that we've been discussing a lot. Um, so the word workshopology has come up quite a lot. Um, so how do, we, how, do we kind of present, how do we present this stuff and how do we kind of carry kind of conduct workshops and sort of make all this stuff work so we can kind of bring as many, as many sort of new interesting people into, uh, into DIY bio and kind of sort of get people interested in this stuff so you kind of get more of sort of a wealth of experience and a kind of wealth of, um, sort of, of, of background um, sort of into this kind of you know, into biology, into DIY bio. Um, other things, so you know, things, things like so IP has kind of come up a little bit. Um, there's, there's been a, a bunch of these kind of, sort of topics, um, but you know, I, I think we kind of sort of reason covered those quite well. So the original plan was that we were going to have a, a kind of a um, sort of a closed panel discussion amongst ourselves, but I think that's kind of not necessarily in the spirit of, uh, of DIY buyers to have a kind of closed discussion. So we're going to sack that off. Uh, and instead we're going to throw it open to questions um, from the audience. And also, you people who are out there on the internet, um, <laughs> you, yes you, um, we'll, we'll, be, uh, we'll be taking questions via Twitter. So if it looks like I'm checking my phone part way through, that's actually what's happening instead. Uh, via, the, via the hashtag LabEasy, uh, all together like that, um, with a hashtag just there. Um, so, so yeah, I guess we can let's let's kick things off and sort of open open up for questions from the audience. Does anyone have any excellent questions or some terrible questions to say for us? Um, I'm not sure our excellent terms could be slightly tangent. Hand the microphone to you to this one right here. Yeah, you might just want to use this one. Hello. Right. Okay. Yes, okay. Try and keep this brief. Um, yeah, I'm wondering if it might be slightly tangential to what's been discussed tonight, but I was wondering if any of you have heard of a company called Grindhouse Wetware? And if you have, do you have a comment on their sort of projects? I've never heard of them. Anyone? Are they the only one of the They're two definitions of biohacking. There's the definition we're talking about here, and then there's the sort of 40 modifications. I don't think the two communities have much in common apart from The same thing is that, um, you know, I sort of came to here from first hearing about there, and I was just wondering if anyone's had any sort of crossover, if anyone's had any sort of dealings with those sort of people in the past. Anyone? What do they do? Hi, I'm Gina. Tell a bit more about them. Uh, they, it's more in, as far as I can understand, I'm obviously not an expert, but it's more to do with um, sort of the work that like Professor Kevin Warwick explores at the University of Reading. So it's got a lot of long lines of cybernetics, um, implanting devices beneath the skin, haptic responses, transcutaneous energy transfer, things like that. So a lot of the time, I mean, the people at Grindhouse, they met on the biohack forums. Um, so obviously I presume there's some sort of crossover there with the work that's done in hack spaces. And, you know, it's just something I thought I would mention and ask about. Yeah, there's lots of types of body hacking, but uh, I don't know about these people. But I follow work of Professor Kevin Borwick. So we've done some experimentations in our lab uh, with body modifications, but it's not uh, for purpose of art, or like Selak does with an ear in his arm and stuff like that. Uh, I've done some research on life extension and uh, like accenting human limitations and stuff like that. So using different kinds of techniques, technology, do-it-yourself, pharmaceuticals, and all sorts of stuff like that. Everything legal, of course. <laughs> so yeah, uh, they they are they are connected with, with us in one way, it's, uh, but it is like by the definition. So you can call all sorts of stuff biohacking, and I've done only those that are like have a purpose for 
transhumanistic progresses. Because one thing um, Grindhouse had mentioned in the past is that um, they worry very much about the scientific method. A lot of people who have done similar things in the past have done it in a very hack and slash way. You know, literally they will grab a bottle of vodka, they will pour it on their arm and then they'll take a swig themselves. Whereas people like this particular company are trying to, as it seems to be with the work that you guys are doing uh, here and in hack spaces and in your own, you know, in your mother's basement and things like that. Um, <laughs> You're trying to be not necessarily professional in the sense that you're a part of like a corporate entity, but at least you are trying to remain hygienic, trying to kill on these things. Whereas it seems in the past there are a lot of people who were literally willing to slice open their fingers, insert some neodymium in there, and then just run with it, you know. Yeah, exactly. I know of whom are you talking about, Clapton on him. Yeah. 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 Uh, we are more like Professor Kevin Warwick than her. We do our stuff uh, scientifically, following proper literature, exploring, uh, researching before doing anything. I don't think any one of us has experimented with uh, sur surgery or... I did. <laughs> yeah. I did a little bit, but it was <laughs> not something like that. So. And uh, we are doing like, I've done some research that is connected with that sorts of stuff. Like, uh, there is a trend now in the world that people uh, surgically implant small magnets in their fingers to get more senses and stuff like that, but none of us has done that. And I'm supporting it if done in proper conditions, but not. Uh, at home with kitchen knife and a bottle of vodka. We, we, none of us support stuff like that. So, just to make it clear. But uh, I've done some research like Professor Warwick has. Uh, he has recently done uh, connecting uh, living nervous cells with computers to observe them in real time. How they behave with the microscope. That is like the first time that anybody has succeeded to do that on a cellular level. And we are currently doing it. People done that ten years. No, no, this is like for a long time observation under the microscope. People have done that. Great resolution. <laughs> they have analyzed it. Uh, Professor Wallick has not invented something new. He's picked up and publicized something people have done a few years. I know, but they have used different methods. Different, <laughs> these are, different PR methods, yes. <laughs> these are slides. Okay, they all have money. We don't have money, most of us. But you can do stuff like that at home also. For example, I'm printing, I'm printing nanomaterial that can be biocompatible and that can be used to uh, make your own MEAs, that is microelectrode arrays that can be connected with nervous cells using gold pencils. You can, for example, dissolve gold pencils, burn them with a laser burner and make connectors to connect with train and stuff like that. But it is just proper research done step by step. We are still not <laughs> at the point where we, we can try to connect to humans and stuff. <laughs> Thank you. I think uh, kind of the unspoken distinction between your grindhouse kind of guys and Kevin Warwick and what we would call biohacking is that it's kind of, I mean, it's grey versus green. Um, Kevin Warwick and a lot of transhumanists are using silicon, they're using, you know, graphite, and that's your grey technology, the technology we're all accustomed to where you make things out of rocks. And you may, you may cover them in, like, you know, plastics and stuff to make them look pretty, but that's rock technology. And there's a, there are challenges to getting that into the human body safely, like neodymium. Under supervision, it is still dangerous because some people will react very badly to neodymium. Yeah, well, it, some people are fine. Other people will go into toxic shock and you need to take it back out and treat them immediately or they die. So you really shouldn't just pour the vodka and go for it, you know? But we do get people coming onto the deal by a group, Google group semi-regularly going, I want a GFP tattoo. And I've actually seen, uh, I, I've seen, like, I don't know how authentic they are, but I've seen, you know, bootleg pictures on mobile phones, kind of, you know, over this, of people who have given themselves GFP tattoos. And these aren't biohackers, like, in a basement somewhere. These are academic scientists who are working around with this stuff every day, and they're doing genetic modification of mammalian cells for cancer research. And they go, I wonder if it would work if I just go, and they, and they go, yeah, cool, I'm going to glow in the dark leg. That's quite dangerous. It actually really is, you know? And our advice is immediately, don't do that yet. We're, we are not at the level where we know you can give yourself a GFP tattoo without getting cancer or a strong autoimmune response. And I go to the level of advising people not to work with mammal cells at all. 
because the cells in the petri dish don't have an immune system, so they can catch a disease, and that can amplify up in the petri dish, and you can catch it. When I was doing cancer research, I had to get vaccinated for Hep B, because you can catch it from the cells. So, like, some people are like, yeah, gung ho, I just, I just want to have like a glow in the dark third eye in my forehead, and I want to, you know, <laughs> churn out my own vitamin C so that I don't have to bother with my diet anymore. I'm like, no, 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 no. There's so much more interesting stuff you can do without killing yourself. So we're just doing both. <laughs> and the Grindhouse guys are, it's parallel. So there are a lot of crossovers. We get a lot of people on the list who are very much into every branch of transhumanism. One of the most active guys on the list is Brian Bishop, and he is just. Uh, a mentalist, like he is on every list in the world. Yeah. And like, for him, it's all about the transhumanist agenda, you know? So he would be interested in Grindhouse as well. I'm sure if I look at any Grindhouse mailing list or I think, there'll be Brian Bishop patching himself in. So there's huge crossover, but they're also, they're parallel, but they're not, there's, they're, you know, we're, they're different branches. One's organic, one's kind of silicon, I think. But anyway, that would be my, my take. Can I add two comments to that too? Yeah, first, most of us have voluntarily decided to work under what are called biosafety level one conditions, which means that because of that property that Kahal was talking about, we can't work with um, primate cells, human cells or primate cells. You can work with mouse cells or bovine cells because they don't carry viruses that are transmissible to humans. But um, so that's one thing and and the other is uh, there's there's this um this answer that i get a lot from people uh, usually when you say something like well can i just spit into a petri dish and culture it and the answer people say is well come on people have been doing stuff like this for years i i mean before there were formalized labs people just contacted with all sorts of stuff and you know they lived, and I'm like, yeah, but a lot of people probably died too. <laughs> so, you know, it just because a lot of people get away with something, as you said, what if you're the percent that doesn't? And that's how modern medicine advances, is the people that kill themselves get written up, and then we know something more about the process. So. Don't be one of those people. <laughs> well, do be one of those people and we'll write it up. <laughs> Don't be one of those people. Sorry. Internet. You should do it as well. one of those people so that we can be watching. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it's worth saying again that if you amplify something in a petri dish, a lot of the toxicity of things has to do with how much of it there is. So people carry strep and staph on their skins, but it isn't generally harmful. But if you start growing it up in large quantities in a petri dish, then it can become more harmful. Check. There's, um, I think, one of the interesting, convers unexpected conversations from the um, the FBI DIY bar conference that a few of us were at was the, the guy from the UN going, yeah, if you, if you invent a new drug and try it yourself, you already passed the first stage of clinical trial. Which was <laughs> 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 kind of a kind of way that wasn't necessarily thought. I was like, well, I don't actually have anything that I want to try it myself, but thanks for that, that's a great tip. Um, is, is, uh, is, are there any more questions? I have a question. Uh, my, microphone, please. What is this? Hello. Um, it's just a simple question. The FBI DIY Bio Conference sounds quite intriguing. I'm just wondering what kind of questions they asked you and, and how you responded, because it sounds like it was a fun day. <laughs> yeah, it was a fun three days. Um, well, so quite quite a few people here. It's going to be uh, this is the, F the FBI DIY Bio Conference for, was something that happened in June of. Last year? Yeah. Actually, there um, were two of them. The yeah. second was international, the first right, was only was the international outreach. Uh, okay, so yeah, so we were just part of the international one. We didn't get invited to the other one. Um, so they, um, <laughs> they probably so didn't have the funds. <laughs> <laughs> they probably didn't have the funds for the second one. Um, so they, um, so they, yeah, they had a conference in, in June that we, we had a, well, I think 
pretty much everyone here, we got the invite right for you know, the FBI email out of the blue going, we'd like to invite you to, to San Francisco. Uh, to come and hang out with the FBI for a few days. <laughs> well, like, brilliant. No idea what to make of that. And some of, some of us, some of us went. Some of us didn't, um, for for very various different reasons. Um, yeah, it was kind of it was it was quite intriguing. I think there's, in some ways, it's kind of quite. I'm I'm actually quite frankly more terrified of the uh, of the of the regulatory powers in the UK than I am in the US, because at least in the US they're kind of like, actually, they've, but they've made some terrible mistakes. Mm -hmm. um, Carol Pentecost just here, there's Where? been at the, sorry, Claire Pentecost, yes, sorry, sorry my apologies, uh, has been at the sharp end of that with Steve Kurtz and the British Pilates Ensemble. Um, and having made several particularly bad mistakes, they're kind of at least now trying to sort of like reach out a little bit more and kind of understand you know, they've, they've already kind of figured out that there's no possible way, you know, it's like trying to stick a finger in a dam, there's like, you know, you put your thumb in, there's going to be like three more biohackers, like, sort of pop out of the woodwork. There's just no point in trying to stop this stuff. Um, so at least, you know, you, you should like, try and understand it, which is good. Um, so in, in, in the US, they are, you know, there's at least some kind of dialogue there. In the UK, we haven't had any dialogue yet. Um, there's, to, to my knowledge, Nobody from sort of the UK police or you know sort of from any different regulatory powers has actually got in touch with us guys to say you know, like what, what are you doing? Uh, you know, sort of what's going on here? We've had you know we've had a lot of uh, contact with uh, with academics, um, but not so much with um, law enforcement in the UK. Um, so the, F the FBI thing was kind of yeah it was kind of yeah it was interesting. I'm going to hand over to somebody else. Um, yeah. but, uh, it was. I guess it was kind of interesting that like some of us only went with permission of our hacker spaces. So I believe the the Prague hacker space, um, their their um, their representative only went with the permission. They they actually went to some sort of consensus and said, you know, should we go? Should we not? Yeah, I think that. Yeah. Oh, you went to. I mean, you also went with. with the yeah. Permission. Um, <clears throat> um, actually, actually, I went there uh, alone. Uh, because um, I, I had the occasion to bring one person with me and none in La Payas really wanted to come actually uh, because they, didn't, they couldn't understand why the FBI would actually get involved with them. Um, it's, it's a personal choice. Uh, we did have the vote uh, in order to know if I should go or so. Uh, and and the majority, of course, uh, one. But I really wanted to bring uh, like a, a pillar of of the organizations, not just a, a, um, a new guy. Uh, so that's why I, I was I was very surprised uh, by this kind of reaction. So I'm I'm new in the hacker community, and uh, I'm more coming from the biology, the academics, uh, and uh, I went there more for the you know the maker side, and I met there. I think. A big part of the philosophy which is being active towards uh, um, philosophy and ethics, and um, and that that was actually one wall uh, that I met there uh, that some some people are just not ready to deal with anybody because of their past actions, which which is fine also. Yeah, I, I'm one of them. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, I, I got the invitation to go to the FBI conference as well, and I, I was one of the people who didn't go. And we actually did have kind of an interesting, it was a private off-list discussion with us, but we were all on Gmail at the time, so I was kind of joking, you know they're just reading this anyway. Like, this is the FBI, I mean, they went through Petrasa's email you know, just to fish and find something, and they found it, so you know, that's how that happened. And for a lot of us, that was a good reason not to. For one thing, there was the Steve Kurtz affair, which they never, institutionally speaking, they never apologized for. None of them have even recognized it. And in a transcript from, I, th I don't know, was it the Open Science Summit, or was it uh, the Outlaw Science Summit? But it was one of these uh, summits, and Brian Bishop, <coughs> our, our, our you know, patch man operator, in, it was there, like, furiously transcribing everything. And in a transcript, Len Sassman, who had also experienced the sharp end of um, domestic policy in, the, in America, had, um, had basically stood up and said, you've never apologized for this. And an FBI guy kind of got up after him. Now, to be fair to them, this is Ed Yu, he wasn't one of the guys who'd screwed with Steve Kurtz. 
But he was never the best. And you, he, he's the, Steve, Steve Kurtz. Okay. Uh, Steve Kurtz. This is a story. Steve Kurtz. It's a very long story. It's a, <laughs> we have a book in the library. There's uh, a book about the back. Yeah. Here, look, you're okay. So, so, uh, okay. So as well as DIY bio, there is also like a bio art or well more tactical bio politics. So these are activists that are inter interested in uh, intersecting with with. Um, uh, issues of the day and he had been part of this uh, organization called Critical Art Ensemble for like at least 10 or 12 years. They're always in, interested in things like, you know, uh, DNA hacking or, you know, the genetic politics. engineering and um, his wife died. But then the FBI turned off and then they went, what are these Petri dishes? And that, you know, the, the rest of the story is so long that I can't even really explain it. but. Well, actually, well, I think Claire can. Claire can, but we have people um, here. I can say that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll try to. No, no, I don't think this is not easy. But I'll try to be quick. Um, it's not on. It's not on. Quick and quiet. Okay. Um, the, see, the police investigate any death in the US um, that's unexpected. So, Hope Kurtz died in her sleep at age 44. So she had a heart condition, okay? But the police investigated, they saw biology equipment, freaked out, um, notified the Joint Terrorist Task Force. And you guys are responsible for session of teenagers for terrorism to this day. Well, Cathal has even more information about them. Um, and because, you know. Was there a documentary about this? Was that thing? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, um, but then the FBI got involved. And I actually was with Steve because I went to be with him the next day um, after Hope died because he was alone. And I'm a friend of his. And so the FBI picked me up at the airport. And um, we were detained, and since we thought we had nothing to hide, we answered all their questions. Um, and then when we finally got a lawyer 22 hours later, they said, the lawyer said, stop talking. <laughs> and what they're doing is illegal. But I guess the way I understood it was that it was quickly handed over to a district attorney who was um, very excited about the fact that he had put away the Lackawanna Six, which were six young men who were Yemeni, who were, um, went to a training camp, a, you know, jihadi, and they were people who were really actually innocent. But it was one of the few cases where the U.S. government could say, we got them, right? And um, so this this prosecutor was very um, excited about this and had convened a grand jury, and they couldn't come up with any bioterrorism. So they pinned um, mail fraud and wire fraud. And then, I won't go into the details, but um, it took four years for a judge to finally just throw it out of court and say, this is ridiculous. Um, but the Four years is enough to crack somebody, somebody with principles who's not going to plea bargain. And because Steve had so much support, he made it through that. But um, that's the method. And it's hard to say where the FBI ends and the Justice Department begins. Um, so still, they should all apologize, you know, the whole lot of them. So that's the quick story. See, that's, that's, definitely, that's definitely tangible. What was the question again? I mean, this, this is like, um, I mean, this, 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 it's kind of important that, this, I mean, this is kind of quite a, um, like Steve, Steve Kurtz is like held up as like a real sort of example of kind of where the FBI got it wrong. Um, and, and was very much kind of in, in everybody's, like sort of foremost in everybody's minds when the FBI DIY bio comes from this kind of invite sort of popped, in, popped into everybody's inbox. It was like, but Steve Hang on a minute, what? Though, right? 
Was he invited? No. No, 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 no. I haven't gone home and emailed him. He knows about it. Yeah. Let's go Let's talk, oh, right, yeah. Let's talk is seen to be just trash talking the FBI because I didn't want to leave it hanging on that. Um, <laughs> you know, the thing is, like, an institution can be evil and the people in it can be trying to do a good thing. And, you know, I, want to, I, I was going to get to say that, like, since that, although there have been no formal apologies given, you know, there are people like Ed Yu in his office who have been doing a really bang up job going out and talking to biographers and, like I said, trying to get to understand the movement and to, to talk to people before this kind of thing happens again, and to try and get it out there. And I, I mean, I, I've got people telling me who've actually have engaged with them, that like, they're often the guys coming up and talking down the nutcase politician who's like, let's ban it, let's just ban it, you know? So, I, you know, I don't want to be seen to be just trash talking the guys, you know? But when, we, when I was invited, and a couple of other Europeans, um, we were kind of thinking, there are a lot of reasons why we kind of just don't feel comfortable with this. For one thing, a formal apology is forthcoming. I mean, there have been wrongs done to bio-artists, and, you know, if there's no formal apology given, then that is a tarnish upon your reputation when you do come forth to talk to people. And we're kind of waiting for that. The other thing was that we had a philosophy that, like, there is an element of, yeah, you should go and you should engage with, your, with people who may be afraid of what you're doing, no matter who they are, law enforcement or otherwise. But on the other hand, if they come and act as if what you're doing is criminal until you engage, then that's kind of not an attitude we were comfortable with either. So we were kind of saying, look, we already share everything we're doing on our blogs. We already tweet about it, we take pictures, we post about it, it's all on the mailing list, like, you know, do this, don't do that, we advise people to be safe. So we're already completely in the open about biosafety. So if someone comes along and sort of, you know, the, the model is in order to create a framework for safe biosafety, you know, uh, responsible biosafety, we're already doing that. So why do we need to legalize this? We haven't committed any crimes. And I had a great experience in Ireland, because <laughs> Ireland is a... Very chilled out, you know, very chilled out. There's a four-person team in the whole country who do a good job of regulating genetic modification. But there's just like, I think there's only four of them. And like, they, they just have this office in Wexford, um, in the middle of this like, cam campus full of cows. And literally I went up to these guys and they were just like, like, you know, okay, do you think, they actually suggested that we form a biohacker space. They were like, we don't want to license every individual guy. Could you not just get a gang together and license together? <laughs> <laughs> I loved it, it was great. And I, I had a very bureaucratic experience with them because that's how bureaucratic work, bureaucracies work. But since then, I've kept getting emails, so I, kept, I keep getting letters from them. I'm like, oh no, the bureaucracy is after me again. And I open it, it's them saying, stop sending us these report letters because we're not interested. <laughs> So, like, good experiences. And then the police in Ireland, the Gardaí, um, I was, the EPA's consent condition said you have to let the local emergency services know that you have a lab. So I went to the ambulance service, and knock on the door, and they buzzed me in, and they all just, it was like an old man pub, they just stared at me <laughs> until I walked out. They didn't even care, and like, it was like, what, what is it? I, I have to drop off a notification of a lab. And they're like, okay. And they took it, and they just stared at me, and I walked out. It was really weird. But, and you know, the fire service were in, genuinely interested. But they didn't care about the bio stuff. Like, yeah, whatever, whatever, what chemicals do you have? You know, so it was very <laughs> pragmatic. But the guardy, the guy went off on a rant. He was like, are you doing anything illegal? And I was like, no. Why the hell do they want you to die? If you're not breaking the law, why the hell is it our business? I mean, this is, they, they want people to ask us if they can put up a ladder. And I was like, okay, cool, cool. Uh, yeah, 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 I'm glad you're not, no risk of you guys going overboard anyway. So it's a very different culture, and I was glad I have that. And, yeah, Europe-wise, Europe a couple of us didn't go because we were feeling that should be how it is. It should be the law enforcement. You, you have this dialogue, but it's not blown out of proportion. It's not this thing where you have to engage, and if you're not engaging, we'll ask your friends to keep an eye on what you're doing to make sure you're not going to radicalize and kill everyone. And yeah, we just chose not to go for that reason. So like, I suppose I'm, I don't know how many other people chose not to go that are here. So, you know, I was going to put that. Mark is busy. <laughs> Mark is busy. Mark's always busy. But I forward an invitation. To everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Open it up. I have a question. Um, I have two questions. Uh, one, is, are G uh, transgenic crops allowed in Ireland? Mm, no. Topical. Topical. Um, yeah, this is, this is the thing. GMOs in Europe for human consumption are not legal. Now, they are up to, as Brian has often pointed out to me, up to 0.5%. But I, that, 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 
Rachel. Rachel? Yeah. And um, not here, but 1%. 1%. 1%. 1%. 1%. 1%. 1%. 1%. 1%. 1%. 1%. 1%. 1%. 1%. 1%. 1%. 1%. 1%. 1%. 1%. 1%. 1%. 1%. 1%. 
I think all of us here hope to be able to have safe, genetically modified organisms in our own homes. Not everybody. <laughs> no, you, you don't want safe ones. You want unsafe well, ones. We have them. You have them as Americans. We are aware of that. I'm wearing them. Everything I'm wearing is probably genetically modified. Okay. No, no, but, but, but we aren't part of the production. Yogurt and your food? Yep, soy beans. Yeah, but it's not our production. But you're like, talking to politicians. You're like, he's, the, he's our ambassador. <laughs> um, I'm talking about France. Um, very early, um, even though the lab of La Payette was not set up, because we had this label DIY Bio, uh, we were just a small community of people gathering and discussing stuff. Uh, we had already a lot of people coming up and say we want to make a documentary. Uh, and, you know, it's like we were like big association and uh, like I was really doing stuff, but we were not yet, you know. And um, so I had to protect actually us, refusing everything. And like for almost one and a half year, I was just uh, you know closing the doors to all journalists. They like, no no no, we are not ready yet. No no no. I mean, if you really want to learn something about DIY, you should just go to the U.S. or Kahal, which was one of the very first in Europe to do stuff, some real stuff, you know. And um, and I, I actually, <laughs> there is a French documentary right now uh, being done on. Yeah. And um, <laughs> and but then uh, at some point we said it was okay. Uh, to get open and to be public, uh, and so we just organized, you know, like a big party. Say, so, yeah, now we are open. Now you can come and let's have fun together. And so, but then journalists arrived, and their first question was just about synthetic viruses and synthetic biology. Said, no, no, it's 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 not it's not right. I mean, we are not doing that. You know, it's just about open source and open biology. We want just you know to do simple stuff and show what's, what's good and, and what's possible in a very simple setup. Um, and just, but I had, because I had actually a, a background in synthetic biology, I was an academic, somehow, um, actually it helped a lot, uh, La Payas, to just give a, a good mark at the beginning, saying, um, as, as like a big journalist from um, uh, AFP, um, and uh, they say, okay, we are, you know, we have all the capacity to do GMOs. We we can do cloning if we want. We, we can do everything. This all this past stuff. Uh, uh, I mean, you're talking about, but we won't because we are not pirates, you know. And we have an ethics. So I'm like, I'm really strong, and uh, so that don't bother me with that. And and since then, <laughs> we haven't actually, and it was very fortunate. So. Uh, I mean, it's been one year that uh, we've been we, we had a, a, a lot of interactions with journalists, and and all the questions were very much constructive and uh, much more focused on what is really DIY bio, and we didn't have what's happening right now still, I guess, in the U.S. Uh, all those questions about synthetic viruses and synthetic biology are being done in, in private labs. That's right, Ellen. Do you still get bothered about those questions? Well, uh -huh. I. I guess one thing, I think the, the attempt to kind of get a consensus about what DIY bio is and if it has a political position is kind of the wrong way to look at it because it's a, it's a movement of individuals and everybody has a different thing that, that they believe in. I think there are some general unifying principles which is that, you know, freedom of expression, freedom of speech is really important and not, you know, hurting other people or screwing anything up is important. But within those parameters, there's quite a spectrum. And in the very beginning, I had some discussions with people. Um, one of them was Mackenzie Cowell, who felt that there was um, an obligation, if you were doing this, to push the boundaries. Um, another was a, an artist named Natalie Jeremijenko, who we were going to set up a lab actually in her space until she started saying that to her, the lab in an office space was the project and that it was this political statement, at which point we backed off and found another place because for our particular group, 
We just wanted to do some science. And we would have, you know, anything within reason we would have fulfilled, which we did in order to do it. You know, we have a service take away our biohazardous waste. We don't try to decontaminate it ourselves. We wrote a safety manual. All that kind of stuff just because we didn't want to be bothered with, we didn't want to be seeing, seen as someone who was making a statement by putting a lab in this building. We were just people who wanted a lab, so we put it in the building. But there's a spectrum. I'm not saying that people that do that are outside of the realm of what we're doing. Um, the area that I particularly am, political is such a big word, about is exactly what you're talking about, which is that uh, I don't <coughs> like people making us out to be something that we're not, giving us motives and, and actions that aren't ours. And I, I don't like people saying what kind of science should be used or, or uh, um, applied based on an in, incomplete knowledge and propaganda from either the religious right or people who are um, very, very scared that science is going to mess up the planet without any evidence backing that up in a particular case. I don't mind if people decide to ban genetic engineering in, in a particular instance, but I want it done from a position of knowledge and consensus around that knowledge uh, not from from ignorance and fear. That's the only thing I'm I'm worried about. So that's 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 the extent to which I'm political. Yeah, but then that's yeah exactly. But then that's kind of in a very very roundabout way, kind of where where I was headed with the sort of the, the news angle. I think we've got time for one more question. Um, this guy at the back. Just interested um, what the sort of no patent kind of hack version of the world looks like if you if you if you were actually, we actually could scale it up. So obviously the the sim simple argument is oh we need patents because yeah you might be able to sort of discover or invent something fairly cheaply and hackly, but then actually making it into something that. Um, it is sort of ready for consumption and can be scaled up and go through all the regulatory processes and so on is actually expensive and so you need patents to then give you a limited time monopoly so you can get enough money back to pay for it. So what's the, um, what's the answer if you get rid of the patents? Um, we we'll brave all be happy and free <laughs> and ignore the patents. Really, ignore them. Just ignore them. <laughs> it would be unfair if I didn't hand that question over to Carl. <laughs> How would a world without patents look? How would a world without patents look? I believe it would be a better world. Yeah. First of all, um, I don't know. Um, that, but there has been a movement, slow step by step, towards that world. And it's going to take a long time. I do think we will live in that world at some point. Uh, there has been cases in India with Novartis. And it's because like more players are in the field now. That It's not just a few in companies. It's a lot of other places in the developing world that want to create their own medicine. And slowly, I think, there's a global shift in the patent issues. Um, we have a very a small part of the same kind of shift of a culture towards more open. Um, there has been all the operating system, there's been lots of other stuff has slowly moved into society. We have like open democracies now, kind of inspired by a bunch of geeks in the 80s running Linux systems. And I think on the long term we will have that. Same with open access to publications. Slowly, I think we will go to that world. How it's going to look like, I don't know, but I think the faster we go, the better. So one, one of the interesting things from, from my perspective coming from a kind of a, a, like a digital technology side, and so one of, one of the things that makes open source work is open source licensing. So you know, there's um, so like the M MIT license, uh, you know, sort of GPL, like, like the open source licenses are really kind of, that forms the legal backbone that allows all of these open source projects to, to bloom and to, you know, 
to create something awesome. So, you know, it's like the, the Googles and Apples of this day would not exist without open source software. Um, in the biology world, that's kind of difficult because there's no concept of copyright. Um, it's something that Robert Carlson, Biology as Technology, there's a whole kind of like chunk of that book that's dedicated to IP that's really, really interesting. Because um, you, can't, you can't copyright biology, I mean, it's just, that's just, it's just not doable. Whereas you can, you know, so you can copyright and trademark, uh, I mean, so like, like, like business names and, you know, sort of digital technologies. You know, Facebook is built on open source software, but, you know, there's, there's still, it's like Facebook has copyright over, you know, that's the stuff they built, and it's all licensed in a particular way. Um, in biology, not so much. Uh, and that's, that's kind of, that's a real, that's a real problem. And we're, in, in the moment, so there's kind of, there's this whole sort of, so patents are there as a way to, uh, you know, sort of the, the patent system doesn't, Necessarily work as a way to um, control the kind of you know sort of for people to be able to sort of extract this kind of value from uh, from the work that they're doing. Um, but there's on the other hand, there's also no copyright, so there's not really any particular alternative. At the same time, the technology is just moving on, just a pace. So you know, there, there's things like like the stuff that Carl was showing, like golden rice. You know, it's like all the papers are there. I, mean, no, I don't think it would take like an open source guy if they were like sort of sat there, kind of like really, really working at it, just to actually recreate all of that. And you know, they've been trying to. They were trying to open source that for a very, very long time. Um, so, can, what what happens when this stuff actually becomes kind of simpler than you know, when when some of you like you know, sort of Monsanto goes, okay, so we created this thing, and there are hundreds or thousands or you know tens of thousands of labs that can just go, oh yeah, okay, great, well you know you have shown us how to do it, that's that's really nice of you. We'll uh, we'll just bash that together in our backyard, which you know perhaps will happen in the future. You know, there, there's gonna Something's coming in the future where there, there's going to have to be a kind of a reassessment of how all this works because it's it's, you know, it's it's spaces like this and you know so these guys with the real sort of like kind of like sharp end of that but you know there's yeah it's kind of unworkable. Um, one, one last question. One last last question. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. this guy just said what from. Sorry, you were trying uh, you were trying to really end there, but. I completely forgot what I was going to say. Good <laughs> question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, no, no, it was about uh, uh, biologists and, and academics and people being able to have some sort of say in this conversation because they're very restricted in what they can say with their, uh, within their careers, the constraints they have and what they can say. And uh, there's a more insidious thing that holds them back, not just patents and what have you, but them being able to have a, some sort of part in this conversation. Um, and what you guys are doing really makes it more able for them to say something and have some sort of partake and use their expertise as it were. But at the moment I feel there's a lot of people aren't able to say a lot of stuff. I don't know if that resonates in some of your experiences or what you think, I don't know. If you've got any comments on that, I think it's productive uh, for <laughs> scientists to be able to uh, say stuff which they're not allowed, not able to say because their funding bodies or their institutions don't want them to say. So saving the world and feeding the poor and all the shit is not good press for someone who wants to get a job. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think there was a question in that. There's, is yeah, that sure. we can yeah, 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 like, can we yeah, no, and one of the one of the hazards of genetic modification for institutions is that you get activists who come in and destroy the crop. The same goes for animal testing that kind So I'm I'm wondering have have any of you had any interaction with this conservative streak of the uh, radical green. <laughs> well, actually, we are, we are safe by the law since we cannot do any GMOs, so they don't have anything to do with us. <laughs> okay, yeah, but you, yeah, so you would still get green activists very suspicious of what white I, I, I try personally to go in any uh, public debate there is about synthetic biology and to represent the amateurs in the bio in general. And because I mean, we need to speak up also, um, and and yeah, there are extremists, uh, there are presence around us, uh, <laughs> but um, but yeah, I mean, 
we definitely have a neutral position in La Paz, at least, where we don't say this is bad, this is good. Uh, we don't say that this is technology which would be manipulated with scare. Um, and we just actually offer right now like tools to uh, like in many other biohacker space actually to uh, to um, to be able to analyze yourself like to make, to have a counter tool to uh, uh, to analyze your own food your own uh, clothes or your own I don't know, your own DNA if you want but um, you're not yet genetically modified um, um, but it's um, yeah, I would I would say that we don't have anything to do with them right now. Uh, probably because I don't know about you because you have actually a license to do GMOs. Yeah, I I, I do GMOs. Um, <laughs> small, small ones, very small ones. And I am I am waiting for the first placards outside the house. I, I really, and I, I have still been waiting. And I've gone to I went to an event hosted in Science Gallery, which was about the future of food, and it was a big crowd full of foodies. Like, you know, organic grow your own foodies, mm. damn you Monsanto. And I was all damn you Monsanto. I mean, I don't like big companies owning our food supply. I don't care if they make it or con are conducive to its production. But patents, I, I ah, you know, so I was having a great organic from them as well. And it didn't change many minds at the end of it. But I have become aware that what we know as the green movement is now actually quite an old movement. And movements stagnate. And people who come from the ideals of the movement can either become really introspective and lock into the, the movement even as, it's, even as some of its core assumptions may be proven wrong, and you get Greenpeace. Or they move on and they form <laughs> new movements which are the same ideal, protecting the environment, advancing uh, you know, clean energy and clean production and agriculture, but according to modern science. So now you have a lot of ex-Greenpeace guys coming out saying, you know what, GM crops allow us to grow things according to the ideals of organics with less chemical inputs, with less damage to the soil, with less uh, collateral damage. So it's, it's actually like, really hypocritical to come out and say like, they're bad for the environment, because in well over 15 years or something of GM crop production, we have yet to see any evidence of damage to biodiversity. And I found that in the crowd, and I went to another event, which was in uh, Kilkenny, and it was hot potatoes, I mentioned it already, and again, it was a big crowd full of foodies, and the only person who kind of got up and walked out was a Green Party councillor. Everyone else, all of the other like we, we, hippie people in there, like I'm, I'm a hippie, I'm, I'm a vegetarian, I try to eat organic because it's generally better for the environment than chemical inputs and I can't buy GM. But um, like, you know, I felt that, you know, it's really easy to communicate with people and Ireland is a very conservative country. So I found, and I, I have a post drop inside my lab window and it doesn't say, call me before you burn down the lab. But that's kind of the message I'm trying to get across. It says, look, this is a microbiology laboratory. I work with class one GMMs, which are defined in the legal literature as the following. If you have any questions or concerns, you can reach me on the following number before you burn down the lab. And you know, you know yeah, you could ask if there's anyone in the house before you set fire to it either. But like, I find that most people are actually very it, it's easy to demonize science when it's distant. But when yes. people meet you, and you don't even you don't encounter this, when people see science, they can be very guarded. And if you're not one of these guys who comes out and you're like, yeah, you stupid hippies with your silly ideas, like, if you're one of the hippies, then, which I am, I'm not putting it on, like, um, you know, it, it, people are like, hang on, you're just a guy. You know, we may disagree. And I didn't change any minds at either of those two meetings. But I softened some positions. I had people who were like, you know what, I've never heard someone who wasn't working for the man tell me that I should like GM before. And it's kind of refreshing. And I was like, you know, so it's actually very positive. You know, you expect that they'll come down with the pitchforks and they never come. So that's, that's been my experience. Absolutely.